John D. Rockefeller has been deemed the richest man in American history. When you start adjusting numbers to inflation and the years, John D. Rockefeller ranked as uh, by far the richest man ever in the history of the United States. He was the master of what was called horizontal integration, which is illegal currently. At the time, it was the Gilded Age, so even though it was illegal, no one really enforced it. And what he would do was he would buy up all the startup companies. He was in, uh, involved in the oil industry and made a ton of money in the oil industry. So he'd buy up any new co company that would, um, you know, attempt to start up and, uh, you know, and, and if the person who owned that company did not want to sell it, he would say, all right, I'm going to lower my price so low that you're going to be out of business. So it, it basically gave him no other choice. Um, it's called create a monop creating a monopoly. It's monopolizing the market so you can uh, have total control and charge whatever you want and you're, you make all the money. And that was his goal was to be Standard Oil to be the biggest com company uh, in the world. And, and it really was the biggest oil company in the world and it was. So he monopolized the market through what's called horizontal integration. And that's just buying up all the small startup companies so he could have a, a, a monopoly. And uh, he also would use what's called the interlocking directory, where he would place uh, his own men on the board of directors of other companies, rival companies, uh, so that once they started passing antitrust laws, one way to get around a trust would be, um, you know, or a pool where people, where companies would get together and say, we're going to charge this price, a high price, and then share in the profits to get around that um, so that they, you know, didn't seem to be forming a pool. He would just put his own men on their board of directors and then they'd report back and they all miraculously come up with the same high price. And it was the same thing as the pool. It was just a loophole to get around anti-pool and antitrust laws. Uh, he's considered the richest person in history with an estimated net worth when he was live of $660 billion. Pretty amazing. And there he is there uh, as an old man those two pictures, he was giving away his Rockefeller dimes, which he used to give away to kids, Rockefeller dimes, they were called, and they were be worth about, it'd be like someone giving away $5 bills today. Um, Standard Oil, let's talk a little bit about Standard Oil. At first, Standard Oil was, you know, make, made some money, but wasn't over the top. Um, and that was in the late 1800s, and that was before cars were around, you know, the gas engines and whatnot, that was before that time. Um, so e kerosene was sold uh, to lube, well, oil was used to lubricate, to lubricate machines, like, you know, industrial revolution and machines and whatnot. So they used oil for that, uh, but also as a lighting source too. And, uh, you know, before the electric light bulb was invented in 1885, you used, you burned oil, um, you burnt, you had a flame and the oil, as soon as, and when the oil was gone, you had to put new oil in. So that flame would keep, keep going. So the same idea is like a candle, um, but it was much more efficient than a candle. Once the electric light was invented in 1885, there wasn't as much of a need for kerosene. So standard oils, uh, profits went down. Uh, and then once that happened, uh, you know, they were, I, don't, I wouldn't say going out of business, but they weren't doing as well. And then when the, uh, the gasoline burning internal combustion engine came around, well, then his uh, profits skyrocketed and that's when he became super rich. And he, he started with this standard oil company was out of Ohio. It was so big, this political cartoon is, uh, Standard Oil is shown as a octopus with its tentacles at the White House and the Capitol building and the Supreme Court. And, you know, you have senators and the tentacles of Standard Oil reached out everywhere. They, they were controlling government, basically, and controlling the market. They were super, super powerful. 
if anybody's ever been down south of King City, there's a highway called 198. And if you take 198, uh, go all the way across, you can get to the Central Valley, like to Visalia, Hanford, those places over there, Lemoore, uh, about halfway um, from King City to say Visalia is a little town called Kalinga. And uh, that's, there was a, there's a, there still is to this day, some oil rigs out there, oil derricks that are pumping oil out of the ground, but it was, it was used to be, for, it was formerly owned by Standard, Standard Oil. All right, we'll talk more about Standard Oil and the breakup of Standard Oil a little bit later, uh, but let's talk next about J.P. Morgan. J.P. Morgan uh, made his money as a business organizer. In 1891, Morgan arranged the merger of Edison, General Electric, and Thompson Houston Electric Company to form GE. So he brought those two companies together to make one big monster company that's still around today, GE. Um, so he, he later on is probably more well known in the banking industry. And also uh, he's uh, the man who purchased Carnegie Steel um, from Andrew Carnegie for $400 million at that time was a humongous amount of money. There's JP Morgan there. Here's how uh here's how the government tried to control the likes of rockefeller morgan carnegie and many of the other business titans uh, finally in the mid 1800s mid 1880s sorry uh sherman antitrust was passed by the, by congress and and it was designed to co combat the rise in industrial combinations which is forming of a trust or a pool the most notorious being standard oil the law declared that every contract combination in the form of a trust or otherwise in restraint of commerce among several states or foreign nations is hereby illegal. So any company that would form and get together with another company to form a trust or a pool or a monopoly, that was deemed illegal. Now in 18, mid 1880s, when Sherman Antitrust was passed, government didn't have as much power. Big business was supreme at the time. So they just threw their money around. And in fact, and this is ironic, it was more, effect, more effective at breaking up labor unions than it was breaking up big business. That's, that's how bad things were, right? And, and, and think about it, it's ironic because labor unions are, are trying to help the common man. Well, it was the common man's push to try to control big businesses to why Sherman Antitrust was passed. It was a law that was passed to control big business and big business turned around and used it on labor unions of the, their workers that were working in their factories, saying that if you form a labor union, it's an illegal conspiracy against the business. And many labor unions were broken up under Sherman Antitrust, way more, way more labor unions than uh, businesses that were broken up through anti Sherman antitrust. In the early years of Sherman antitrust, it was not effective at doing what it was supposed to do, break up labor unions, uh, excuse me, break up businesses. Instead, it broke up labor unions. So pretty sad commentary on that. Now, later on, and it's still on the books today, it's still used today. As a matter of fact, Microsoft was um, uh, broken up at one point, not not totally broken up, but some of the things that they were doing and controlling the PC market, uh, they were broken up probably about 15 years ago through Sherman Antitrust. So it's still on the books today, and it's uh, obviously much more effective at uh, at controlling uh, the forming of pools and trusts and monopolies than it was in the 1880s when it came out. I'll talk about that more in, uh, in class too. The breakup of Standard Oil. Um, finally, and this, this is when things started to become more effective when, when uh, they started controlling businesses more during what's called the progressive era. In 1911, uh, after years of litigation, the United States Supreme Court ruled that Standard Oil must be dismantled because it violated federal antitrust laws. The monopoly was broken up into 34 separate entities and uh, that included companies that would become ExxonMobil, Conoco, uh, or Conoco and uh, Chevron and Amico. So some of the same companies that you still see every day today were created through the breakup of Standard Oil in 1911. Well, what, and, and at the end of the day, it actually made Rockefeller even more rich than, than before because he had his hands on each one of these companies. So you see Chevron down the street here. Um, that was a 
originally, you know, part of Standard Oil. So yeah, Rockefeller became really, really rich after that. He became the country's first billionaire because of the breakup of Standard Oil. Again, very ironic. Women in the 1900s, and we're starting to get to the early, early 1900s, um, women who had swarmed to the factories had been encouraged by recent inventions, found new opportunities, and this idea of what was called the Gibson Girl, uh, created by uh, Charles Dana Gibson, became the romantic ideal of the age, a woman, a woman that would go to work, not necessarily in a factory, but may work in um, you know, an ice cream parlor like this picture depicts, or a restaurant somewhere. Um, but you know, that was just an idealism in the early 1900s. Okay, so let's talk about this industrial revolution that's raging in the United States. Well, there's no more Jeffersonian idealisms anymore. That, that ship has sailed. Jefferson, who wanted it to remain agrarian, nah, not gonna happen. Uh, the United States really became a nation of wage earners, right? They were, they were uh, checking in at the factory and checking out when the day was over. It's called the factory system. Uh, so yeah, labor unions were few and far between early on, you know, in the 1860s, 1870s. And then along came the 1880s or so, and you started to see some labor unions that were popping up, but it wasn't easy. The workers in these factories had no rights. Uh, they just couldn't come together. Sherman Antitrust would break up labor unions or, you know, big business could flex their muscles and, and, and say, hey, if you're complaining about wages, we're going to lock you out, which means the doors will be locked. They won't, they won't be able to go to work. Um, it was a reverse of a strike. They would just not let the workers in. They could call in the troops. We've seen Rutherford B. Hayes, uh, Grover Cleveland, two presidents who have called in the troops on striking workers. They could put you on a blacklist if you joined a labor union. A blacklist means that they, they would put your name on a list and say, don't hire this person. He tried to form a labor union. Or they would force you to live in what's called company towns. We'll talk about the Pullman strike uh, where there was, it was actually a company town that uh, you know pe people were forced to live in and they were paid in company script and you couldn't use that company script anywhere off of the premises and it was a way that the factories controlled their workers everyday lives workers had really no rights and here's some some uh things here talking about management versus labor so the owners and managers of business one side the tools of management and then on the other side you have the tools of labor so management could call in scab workers if you go on strike and they'll just bring in other workers. They could use PR campaigns. They could use the Pinkertons, which was a strike breaking organization that the government used. They used it at the Homestead Steel strike. As we talked about lockouts and blacklisting, yellow dog contracts were, uh, con you'd, they'd say, we'll hire you as long as you sign this piece of paper that says I will never join a labor union. So that those are the tools of management. On the flip side, workers in the factories, they could do things like boycotts and strikes, sympathy demonstrations, like go outside the business with picket signs, uh, closed shops, meaning that uh, they could force them to only hire union people and they could do organized strikes. But again, you had to have some leverage to be able to pull this off. And workers in the 60s and 70s and 80s, really 1880s, really didn't have that kind of leverage to be able to do any of this. That's only going to come later on. They would be working in sweatshops like this, working long hours. And then the idea of, of labor, labor unions, right? Well, the, the first ever labor unions, major labor unions in the United States, uh, the two that we're going to really get into would be the Knights of Labor and the American Federation of Labor. Let's talk about the Knights of Labor. Um, their philosophy was all workers unite, and it started in 1869. Uh, they, they pushed for an eight-hour workday along with a whole bunch of other things. It was led by this man right here, Terrence Powderly. <clears throat> and, you know, they got they, their membership in 1885 had went up to about 750,000, which mm, not very, not, not a huge amount, not a huge amount, but the, night, that's the Knights of Labor, the goals of the Knights of Labor, Take a look at this. There's a lot of them. An eight-hour workday, workers' cooperatives, 
worker-owned factories, abolition of child labor, increased circulation of greenbacks, equal pay for men and women, safety codes in the workplace, prohibition of contract foreign labor. Their goals were too far and too wide. There's too many of them. It just kind of gets all caught up in the wash and you don't quite focus on one or two things. Uh, anybody could be a member of the Light Knights of Labor. Uh, you just had to draw a wage, male, female, um, skilled workers, unskilled workers, anybody, any race of people could be members of the Knights of Labor. Their goal, once again, all workers unite. But there's a lot of issues with it. Eventually, the, the uh, Knights of Labor are going to fail. They're going to have a bad strike record, meaning they're going to have their workers go out on strike, and then they're going to eventually get fired. And then now people don't want to go out on strike because they want to lose their job. There was a riot in Chicago, Haymarket riot, um, and there were bombs that went off. There were people that died. And uh, the anarchists, people who didn't believe in government at all, were the ones who instigated that riot. And it was a strike uh, called by the Knights of Labor. So their name, the Knights of Labor, became synonymous with anarchists, even though that wasn't a fair association because they weren't anarchists. But because anarchists were involved in it, anytime anybody talked about it, Oh yeah, what happened at the Haymarket riot with the anarchists and their name became synonymous with anarchists. So people bailed out of the labor union, not wanting to be included in that group, the anarchists. And then this idea of including skilled and non-skilled workers together in one labor union just didn't work. The question came up of who strikes for what? If the bricklayers go on strike, does that mean the teachers go on strike? Does that mean that the you know, other factory workers have to go on strike. There's a lot of confusion on that. And this political cartoon really attests to that. It's a, you know, Knights of Labor, bumbling, goofy. You look at the, the different groups that are represented by the Knights of Labor, whether they're Coopers who are uh, brewers of beer. Um, here you have machinists and bricklayers back here. And, you know, bakers, people, you know, people who are bake, baking, um, carpenters. So you have all these different groups and they just kind of look off a little bit and goofy. So yeah, not a positive look at the Knights of Labor and they eventually failed. What emerged after was the American Federation of Labor, still around today, known as the AFL. Sometimes you'll hear it as AFL-CIO. We'll talk later on about what the CIO was, is. Samuel Gompers founded the American Federation of Labor, and it consists of, of uh, self-governing national unions all under the umbrella of the AFL, but separate. So it's a little bit better organized. Um, so you had the AFL calling the shots, but individual, yeah, like the, the bricklayers would have their, their part. The uh, construction workers would have their, their union, and it was much more, you know, uh, made much more sense to, as to who would go on strike for what. And it was, they called it bread and butter unionism. You know, if you have like bread and butter is very plain and that's all it was. It was for, they wanted three things. They concentrated on three things only. They wanted higher wages. They wanted uh, uh, better hours, less working hours, and they wanted better working conditions. Those three things is all the AFL. That's all they focused on, bread and butter unionism. And it was only skilled workers. You had to have a skill to be a, uh, American Federation of Labor member. So if you were like, your job was to dig the canal, you know, that wasn't going to be a skilled, skilled labor. Now, if you worked on the machines that helped dig the canal, then you could be a member of the AFL. So it was a bit of an elitist organization. You had to be male, you had to be white, and you had to be skilled to be a member of the American Federation of Labor. Sammy Gompers. This uh, map right here shows you the labor unrest between 1870 and 18 or 1900. So you've got strikes everywhere. Wherever there's these red marks right here are their uh, strikes, these counties that, that reported strikes. And then major strikes here, Great Railroad Strike, Haymarket Riot in Illinois, the Pullman Strike, 1894, Homestead Street, Steel Strike over here. Um, yeah, so these are major strikes, the, the, the red, the red, red mark, and then the blotches are, are just strikes. So, you know, Gilded Age filled with labor unrest, just another one of those things that happened in the Gilded Age. And that's the end 
of chapter 24.